Okay, this is how it starts. You're woken up by a strange sound. Not the alarm, though. It's 5 a.m. After a few seconds, you realize the strange sound is a knock on the window. But you live on the 12th floor. Who or what could be knocking? Window cleaners? You live in an ordinary apartment building, not a skyscraper with offices. The knocking is getting stronger. You muster up the courage and go to the window, reach for the curtain, and abruptly pull it aside. What you see is fantastic! There are flying or floating small fish outside your window. Thousands of them! A shoal of sardines rising directly to the sky. A few knock on your window as they pass. There are so many sardines, you can't see what's going on outside. But as the last fish flies by, the full picture opens before you. Large and small fish fly between the houses. Octopuses cut through the air with their tentacles into a rain cloud. A huge whale is slowly drifting toward the horizon. Above the roof of a nearby house, two sharks chase four sea lions. A neighbor waves to you. He holds a fishing rod from the window and waits for the fish to bite. A school, no, a flock of dolphins flies past your window. They cheerfully whistle as if they're greeting you. What's going on? You turn on the TV. All the channels are playing the same thing. Sea creatures of the Earth have learned to fly, leaving the ocean and filling the air. All flights worldwide are canceled, and fishing vessels are idle in the seas, oceans, lakes, and rivers. And no one knows what happened. Well, you get dressed and go outside. Sea turtles crawl on the ground. They shiver, flap their fins, and rise into the air. A flock of shrimp flies past you. Has the ocean lost its gravity? What happened to all the water? You live in a port town close to the sea, so you decide to go to the coast. You reach the shore and see the water is calm. Gravity seems to be intact, but the sea creatures continue to take to the air. Six months later, people gradually get used to the new natural phenomenon. Fish occupy most of the sky. Some sea creatures penetrate the middle layers of the atmosphere. Smaller birds have almost disappeared since the presence of predatory fish in the sky. But birds of prey that hunt fish gained weight. They've eaten so much that they can't fly anymore. Plump gulls, albatrosses, pelicans, and eagles can hardly walk and barely support themselves. Planes stopped flying and ship travel increased. The world's ecosystem is completely changing. The ocean becomes lifeless. The number of bacteria, microbes, and various nutrients in the water move to the air. People get sick more often, and in some areas, it becomes difficult to breathe. When it rains, millions of shrimp and small fish fall to the ground along with the water. Many predatory mammals that have been feeding on fish begin to starve. They go out to the roads and cities to find food. Scientists research the flying creatures and find that they somehow change the structure of their lungs. But how fish got the ability to fly is still unknown. It seems nature just decided to push people out of their usual environment. Fishermen build balloons to fish in the sky. Some athletes throw a lasso at flying whales and ride them like huge horses. Though the landing can be difficult. Creatures that previously swam only in the very depths of the ocean settle at high altitudes. Researchers discover new, previously unknown fish species. From the ocean depths, a giant octopus rose into the air. Many call it the kraken. This monster has found a new home right on top of Mount Everest. Now everyone is afraid to climb this mountain. The most deep water creatures reach space. On the ISS, astronauts observe amazing animals flying past. They look like aliens from other planets, not Earth. In some areas, sharks descend to the ground for food. In these places, people are afraid to go out. Fishing companies buy huge Boeings and attach nets to it to catch fish in the air. But flights are not safe, especially when a whale suddenly appears smack dab in their path. 
authorities impose curfews in many cities. People climb to the roofs and watch an incredible sight at night. Flying jellyfish floating in the air. Thanks to the bioluminescent protein in jellyfish, they glow. Stars in the sky mix with the neon transparent creatures. But be careful! Some of these jellyfish are very venomous. Some people were so fascinated by the beautiful jellyfishes that they touched them and ended up in the hospital. Squid, frightened by the new conditions, release ink into the air. When a lot of squids do this, the ink blots out the light from the sun. Massive traffic jams appear on the roads because electric eels fly through the streets and shock traffic lights. While all of humanity is looking up at the sky, almost no one has noticed what is happening down here. All over the world, people with a strange physical disability show up in hospitals. Weird holes form under people's ears. Doctors don't understand what they're dealing with. But then, one of the patients jumps into a lake, and it turns out he can breathe underwater. All people grow gills. At first, most people refuse to go underwater. But their changed lungs force them to do so, or spend the rest of their lives in a gas mask. Some people are happy to go under the water and start a new life. The human body adapts to the cold temperatures and high pressure. There is a lot of work ahead to create cities and infrastructure, but things are not so bad. There is more space in the water than on land. One year later, humanity begins to fully migrate to the oceans. But instead of a new life, they find trash, a lot of garbage. Billions of tons of plastic are floating in the water. Their new home turns out to be a massive dump that people have created. Global plastic recycling starts in all waters. Every day, people take out tons of trash from the ocean. The water is getting cleaner. Trash dumps appear on land. Five years later, water becomes cleaner. People don't live in garbage anymore. All the plastic is on land. As soon as the problem is solved, humanity begins to build underwater cities. But then all the fish start to fall into the seas and oceans. Everything returns to the usual way of life. People lose their gills, and now they're back on land. Sea creatures live in clean water once more. Philosophers and scientists from all over the world believe that in this way, nature has taught people a lesson. We understand how to live in a world of garbage and how we should care about our planet. People are making a considerable effort to preserve the planet's ecology. Waste recycling plants are built. Every person stops using plastic. Harmony begins between man and nature again. You're sitting in a car in a space shopping mall parking lot. You've just bought a gift for your sister's birthday and should have time to get it to the celebration. Today, there are a lot of people in the mall, so it's difficult to leave the parking lot. Finally, you're approaching the gate. You press the button next to the steering wheel and activate the gravity cushion. It allows the car to hover above the ground at several inches. The car wheels are sliding inside the body, and a huge turbine is coming out of the trunk. The front glass becomes a touch panel with many buttons and screens. The gate opens, the turbine releases a flame, and your car flies out of the parking lot right into outer space. Thousands of flying cars are rushing past you on an invisible space highway. You're moving away from the mall, which looks like a huge space station surrounded by holograms of advertising brands. Before Earth, you need to get to Mars. There, you want to repair the car's engine. The navigator plans a route to the red planet, and you go on your way. You're far from Earth's orbit, so you can get to Mars in several hours. You activate the autopilot and decide to take a little nap. It's 2048. The world's population has exceeded 20 billion people. There's too little space on Earth. Humanity is not ready to colonize other planets yet. So scientists and engineers from all countries start building huge space stations. This unloads the planet by more than 50%. The stations look like huge rings. They imitate the Earth's atmosphere have artificial gravity and vegetation. People move to stations, but often return to Earth. 
Rockets fly between the planet and orbit. But such transport is expensive and inconvenient. Automakers make efforts at creating super-reactive flying cars. Some years later, people slowly colonize the Moon and Mars. Now, getting to the red planet is as easy as getting to the neighboring city. Cars fly along certain routes that are similar to airways for planes. Engineers create special digital highways that can only be seen through the windshield. Of course, you can fly through space as you like in any direction. But if you fly to a mall or the moon, you have to stick to the established digital route. You wake up and approach Mars. People almost don't live here because of the unfavorable atmosphere and difficult weather conditions. But Mars has the biggest service center for cars and the coolest amusement theme park in the solar system. To get there, people have to stand in a space traffic jam for hours. The dashboard shows you have some problems with the turbine. You put on a spacesuit, take a laser screwdriver, and get out of the car. You're in zero gravity, flying up to the turbine and fixing the problem with the screwdriver. There are thousands of cars around you. People are yawning inside, listening to music, and watching movies. You get into the vehicle and slowly move on. The engine or turbine often fails in the middle of a space highway. When this happens, your car activates its emergency mode. The dashboard automatically sends a signal to the nearest repair team. You're just floating in space and waiting until the mechanics arrive. They tow the car to the nearest auto service. You have enough oxygen inside for a couple of days. And if you run out of it, you can ask for help on the internet. Good people flying by will stop and share their oxygen supplies with you. Finally, you get to the car service station. Mechanics install a new super jet engine for your car and repair the turbine. There's not much time left and you promised your sister you wouldn't be late. You get into the car and leave the Martian orbit at full speed. The new engine runs silently and doesn't shake the car. You increase the speed and fly along an almost empty digital highway. On your way, you meet a lot of small satellites showing holographic ads. Fortunately, you have an ad blocker. You turn it on and the space banners become invisible through your windshield. Finally, you see a small blue dot. This is Earth. At this moment, you remember that you need to feed your dog. You leave the route and fly to the moon. There you have a small cottage with a house, which you bought for a small price last year. People can't change the atmosphere of entire planets yet, but you can install a small dome and fill it with oxygen. Inside your dome, you've built a house, a swimming pool, and even a small vegetable garden. In the past, people went to the countryside to take a break from the city bustle. Now, everyone just buys houses on the moon. You fly through the dome, land on the white surface, and put food into a dog bowl. They're renovating your apartment on the space ring, so you live on the moon with your dog for a while. You can see other cars flying up into the neighboring domes. Some vehicles are elite supercars with a large gravity cushion and ultra-reactive engines. They can fly 10 times faster than the speed of sound and have artificial intelligence that can talk to the driver. There are also old, rusty space cars. Sometimes people attach a jet engine to an ordinary car and cover the body with a mix of copper, iron, and silver to travel over long distances in a cold vacuum. You can also see a lot of taxis in outer space. Sometimes getting to the moon is cheaper than getting to the other end of some city on Earth. The reason is traffic jams on the Earth's roads. Also, there are a lot of flying buses in space. Every day, several flights depart on the Earth to Moon to Mars route. People are constantly building something on Mars. The huge car service and the amusement park are done. Now they're creating a scientific center there to study interstellar jumps. Of course, engineers need building materials for such construction projects. Several times a week, long trains fly from Earth to Mars along a separate space route. Initially, trains carried people, but they became unprofitable. It's much cheaper and faster to get to Mars by your own car or bus. Finally, you're leaving the moon and approaching the Earth. The dashboard signals you're out of fuel, so you decide to stop at a gas station. These stations are everywhere. They're fully automated, controlled by artificial intelligence. You're flying up to one of them. The fuel pump is automatically connected to your gas tank. 
The super reactive engine consumes improved rocket fuel instead of gas. You transfer money to the station through the touch panel and fly away. Hundreds of digital space highways lead to Earth, and every road is filled with cars. Traffic jams again. There are security checkpoints in the upper layers of the atmosphere. Customs services check documents and car trunks. While standing in traffic, you're watching garbage trucks. A lot of space debris is floating around. Slow flying trucks controlled by artificial intelligence collect garbage in huge containers. Then they fly away from Earth's orbit and unhook the containers. These garbage cans have little turbines that let containers fly far beyond our solar system. Then they heat up and burn all the garbage from the inside. Finally, you pass all the checkpoints and fly into the middle layers of the atmosphere. Our planet looks like a huge cyberpunk world, but only lighter and more beautiful. Huge cars disperse the clouds to improve visibility. Firefighter flying ships are coming to one of the stations where a fire started. You encounter hundreds of gas stations, air hotels, cinemas, and shopping malls in the sky before you reach the ground. You're approaching a parking building. This is an 80-story skyscraper filled with cars. People leave their vehicles and use elevators to go down. Fortunately, there's a place near your sister's house where you can park your car. You land, put your hand on the passenger seat to take the gift, and oh no! It looks like you left it on the moon. Big herds of dinosaurs run through the forest. The temperature rises rapidly, and everything behind them begins to ignite. Some dinosaurs get stuck in swamps and can't get out. Pterodactyls fly over their heads as they try to avoid the blast wave that will soon cover the Earth. This event happened about 66 million years ago. It wiped out almost every living thing on Earth. Birds and flying dinosaurs were just about the only ones who could survive the most massive extinction event ever. Hey, don't blame me, I wasn't around then. Let's go down their evolutionary tree to look at the world's first bird, Archaeopteryx. It was about the size of a modern raven, but it looked like a small dinosaur with feathers. It had many small, conical teeth, almost like alligators. It's because Archaeopteryx was closer to reptiles than to birds. However, its brain was three times larger than that of these reptiles. Although it had wings with feathers, it could hardly fly like modern birds. Its shoulder joints didn't allow it to lift its wings above its back, so it couldn't make a full wing beat. Most likely, Archaeopteryx was capable of gliding flights with small wing flaps. Evolution has led to more evolved species capable of full flight. Pterodactyls. These guys had no feathers, but membranes made of skin and muscle. Its wingspan was about the length of a human leg. It could fly perfectly and catch fish and small animals. Although flying dinosaurs could easily outrun terrestrial predators like velociraptors and T-rexes, most of them didn't make it through the impact of a giant meteorite. Let's look at this event step by step to see how they got to our time. 10 minutes before the meteorite crash. A massive rock about the size of Manhattan Island is moving towards Earth in space. It weighs 460 trillion tons. That's like 3 trillion blue whales, the heaviest mammals that ever lived on Earth. And it's approaching our planet at 12 miles per second. At that speed, it could cross the Atlantic Ocean in just four and a half minutes. That's twice as fast as our modern spacecraft could fly. Five seconds before the meteorite crash. Ooh, this is getting tense. The Earth's gravitational force continues to pull the giant meteorite. It blows a hole in our atmosphere and creates a popping sound so loud you could hear it on the other side of our planet. All the animals on our planet wake up in a panic. They lift their heads up and see a huge rock that begins to burn through the air. Smaller fragments start to break away from the main meteorite. This fire is so bright that it shines almost like the sun. Flying dinosaurs and other ancestors of modern birds are the first to sense danger. They make a beeline to the sky and try to fly as far away from the impact site as possible to save their lives. The moment of impact. The colossal mass and velocity of the meteorite give it an enormous amount of energy. As soon as it touches the Earth, it causes an explosion of 150 trillion tons of TNT. The blast wave literally rips out chunks of our planet and throws them up. A huge wall of energy begins to move from the point of impact in all directions. It snatches the trees out with their roots and pushes them to the ground like dominoes. The shockwave completely wraps around our planet. This energy turns into heat. Everything around the impact site begins to ignite. 
Green jungles and trees turn into smoldering charcoal in seconds. The ground and rocks simply evaporate. The collision caused a massive earthquake. Some dinosaurs may have fallen into cracks that appeared in the ground. A strong earthquake caused a tsunami with waves higher than the Empire State Building. Dinosaurs that weren't trapped in the burning forest were washed away by the enormous waves. The dinosaurs of North America try to escape by running to the north, but the blast wave inevitably catches up with them. Flying dinosaurs have no problem with earthquakes or tsunamis. They fly high enough to avoid the giant waves. But they will have to contend with continuously falling meteorite debris. Five minutes after the meteorite crash. A meteor shower of giant rock fragments continues to fall to Earth. Some meteorites were the size of a car. Others were more like a large building. Ashes and dust rise into the air. Their temperature is so high that they melt and turn into liquid lava and then fall back to Earth, causing more fires. Meteor showers cause trouble for flying dinosaurs, too. They have to maneuver and dodge the falling red-hot rocks. The high temperatures are a huge problem for them because it might make them lose feathers. With no feathers, they aren't able to fly. 10 hours after the meteorite crash. The dinosaurs continuously ran north all this time. They found themselves in unfamiliar territory with many swamps. Giant dinosaurs like T. rexes have legs as long as an adult human's height. They have a chance to get through this terrain, but if they fell, they could never get back up. The smaller dinosaurs, like Triceratops, had short legs and couldn't go through the dense swamps. One month after the meteorite crash. 15 trillion tons of ash were ejected into our atmosphere. A dark cloud blocked the sun, and the Earth was immersed in complete darkness. Surviving plants couldn't feed on the sun's energy and stopped producing oxygen. Surviving dinosaurs could hardly breathe because of the lack of air and a large amount of dust. The lack of sunshine in the sky made photoplankton disappear. Many marine animals were left without their only source of food. The dust and ashes in the atmosphere prevent our planet from getting heat from the sun, and the temperature here is beginning to drop. The place where the meteorite fell was rich in sulfur. This toxic acid evaporated at the time of the impact and formed in clouds. Now there are acid rains on Earth. Flying dinosaurs now have to hide from these rains. They have to stay in caves and can't go outside to get some food. So far, a large number of terrestrial and flying dinosaurs have survived. They come out to see the aftermath of the disaster. The site of the impact was in present-day Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. The Chicxulub Crater is located here. It's about 93 miles wide, like half of all of Lake Michigan, and it's 12 miles deep. You could plunge the whole Mount Everest in there, and there would still be 6.5 miles of available space. It wasn't the impact itself that made the dinosaurs disappear. The fire destroyed most of the plants the herbivorous dinosaurs ate. With no food, their numbers dwindled rapidly. Predatory dinosaurs had nothing to eat either. Acid rain and the disappearance of photoplankton threatened all marine life. Even though birds managed to avoid the blast waves and tsunami, they were short of food too. About 80% of all birds didn't make it to the end of the extinction event. The problem was that all of the forests on Earth were wiped out. Most birds would nest and live in trees. Besides that, the forests were always full of food, from all kinds of ants and termites to flying insects and small mice. So only those species that lived on the ground and could fly well survived. Most likely, they fed on the seeds of small surviving plants. This habit made flying dinosaurs lose their teeth during evolution. Instead of jaws with a bunch of sharp teeth, they got long beaks to grab tiny seeds from the ground. Although Earth looks like a terrible place to live now, there's an evolutionary boom for birds. They have to travel long distances in search of food. Their wings get stronger. They also feel safe from predators who regarded them as food before. No T-Rex now catches a sleeping bird off guard. About a thousand years after the collision, the first dense forests appear. It gives another boost to evolution. A million years later, forests full of food are populated by the ancestors of modern mouse birds. And 65 million years later, in modern times, we have about 10,000 species of birds. Pigeons, crows, eagles, and hawks, even penguins. These are all descendants of the dinosaurs. But there were other survivors. Some alligator and crocodile ancestors were able to adapt to changing conditions. About 80% of turtle species managed to survive the mass extinction, and now their descendants live among us. 
snakes and lizards were also able to wait out the hard times in their burrows. Even some mammals, like monotremes, survived. This hedgehog-sized animal was able to continue to evolve. Many millions of years later, these mammals evolved into primates, which later gave life to modern humans. Much, much later came the iPhone.